that's the main primary reason I'm running. Let me tell you, I, I was ready to retire. Yeah. <laughs> but when I, when I saw all this happening, mm -hmm. I thought, you know what, somebody's got to step in. Somebody's got to go ahead who has the experience on the department. You know, Jim McDonald has three years on that department. I've got almost 33. Wow. Yeah. And I think that Ten makes, times the amount. That makes a little bit of a difference. Yeah, yeah. you've been there for that long. Um, so what would you do different uh, than, than what Jim McDonald is doing right now? Like what, what changes would you make uh, that, that I know that Jim, uh, he came in, he wanted to clean up corruption, and within that, he's, uh, kind of, he's, he's kind of blocked the deputies from being able to do their jobs. Um, what, and what, what would you do different to make so that the deputies, when they're out there, they feel that, they're, that when they go after somebody, when they go after wh whatever they need to do, that they know that, that they're going to be pre protected for protecting the people as opposed to worrying about, oh, if I do this, um, all of a sudden I'm going to be put on administrative leave, I'm going to may lose pay. I may, like, what, what, are, what are you going to do to make sure that, that the deputies feel confident to be able to do their jobs? Well, there's a lot of things that we can do. And first of it, first thing is we need to look at a lot of the policies. Mm -hmm. A lot of the policies right now are really um, taking the deputies and putting them in a, a position of disadvantage. Let's just put it that way. Mm -hmm. You know, there was an incident the other day over in the La Puente area, in the industry station area, where there was a crazy guy jumping on a roof. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately what happened was the deputies, honestly, they know how to handle the situation, but nobody wanted to touch the guy. Nobody wanted to put hands on anybody and so it ended up that the 83-year-old black pastor that was up there got up on his own roof and pushed the guy off onto his own car. Oh. Mm. And, so, and then the deputies came back and they, they took care of business. But the bottom line was these are the situations where deputies are going, look, at, if I engage, if I do anything, then I'm going to get in trouble for doing my job. And those are the policies that need to change. They need to, be, they need to feel like they're getting backed up. Mm. They need to feel like they have support if they do something. You know, everything that happens to a deputy nowadays, no matter where they go, there seems to be an investigation started. You yeah. know, what I'm told is there's over a 1,000 investigations going right now. Oh, wow. Geez. The little investigations, just the little ones, and this is the way it is. I mean, it's, it's the way the world works in the sheriff's department. Mm. If you have a minor investigation, it takes a year because they do the major investigations first, the ones that are more high profile. Now, that's understandable. Mm -hmm. that you would do that. Right. But how about the poor guys who do very little or the women who do very little and it takes them forever to get back out there and they're under investigation for an inordinate amount of time. Why do you think it takes so long? Uh, the numbers of people that they have assigned and the number of cases that they're opening that shouldn't be opened. I mean, there's ridiculous cases that just get opened that, you know, it's, it's something that before you would take it, you'd handle it very quickly and it would be done. I mean, I can give you a situation the other day that happened in a custody environment where there was a deputy who intervened. Uh, an inmate was going to beat up another inmate, and he got in front of him, and he moved the, the smaller inmate back so he wouldn't get hit, and that turned into a use of force <laughs> simply because he moved the inmate out of the way so he wouldn't get attacked. So he put hands uh, yeah. on the guy. And, wow. and the big guy was cooperative. He, he became cooperative because he didn't want to hit that deputy. But, yeah. but the bottom line is it has to be reported as use of force because he moved the smaller guy back. So is, is changing the, the, the definition of use of force, is, are those times some of the things that need to get changed? Like what, like the, what, are, what are some certain policies? Well, obviously something like that, the, the use of force policy. Um, There's there stuff that needs to make it so that, that, that they need to be able to be able to do their jobs. Um, yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. I, I don't even call it a force policy anymore. I call it a touch policy. Mm -hmm. And that's really what the sheriff's department has now. We have to go back to a force policy wherein there's an intention to actually use force. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, people in the public, you know, if, if you're doing something and somebody you know, just doesn't want to be handcuffed and they say, hey, I don't want to be handcuffed, and they're wiggling a little bit, and then you handcuff them, that's a use of force. <sighs> because the bottom line is they gave uh, some resistance. Yeah. But the public would look at that and go, what do you mean that was a use of force? You know, there, a use of force to the public is not that. A use of force is when a deputy takes somebody and throws them to the ground, mm -hmm. or when you take somebody and you put their arm behind their back and crank it up their back and do things like that. Those yeah. are uses of force. And I feel sorry for the deputies in this regard, because when they go to court, if they're sued or something happens, and then somebody looks at their, uh, what we call the PPI, Personnel Performance Index, they look at that, and all these minuscule things that aren't really uses of force, mm -hmm. it goes to a jury, and it looks like this deputy has 30 uses of force. 
Oh. Well, they, they don't have 30 uses of force. They have maybe one use of force with 29 touches. Yeah. Yeah, but the jury doesn't look at it that way. They look at it and say, oh, my God, this, this deputy's a heavy. This deputy has done a lot of that. And that is the problem that we're doing. Transparency is wonderful. Mm -hmm. But when you're transparent about things that aren't really forced, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So what, what happens in these cases where a deputy is being investigated for this use of force? Uh, is the deputy still working? I mean, what is he doing usually? At it depends point? on the particular case. Most oftentimes now, uh, mm -hmm. probably they're relieved of duty if there's uh, a larger situation mm -hmm. or a situation that's uh, of more impact. But they could leave them at work, put them on the desk, uh, do what they're going to do with them. But most oftentimes they are not in the same position they were doing. They don't put them back out in patrol or, or do those sorts of things until they can adjudicate the case. Okay. okay. Um, Recently, under uh, Jim McDonald, violent crime has gone up, and I'm sure I'm assuming it's because people feel more com more confident being able to go and commit these crimes because they know that the officers have their hands tied and there's not a lot that they can do. Um, so besides, but besides being being giving the officers the the freedom to be able to perform their jobs in a correct fashion, uh, what else can be done to to as, as you if you become sheriff, what can be done to to lower the crime rate? Well, there's a lot of things going on that are, I, th I believe that are raising the crime rate. You know, a lot of it has to do with people getting out of jail a lot earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, if you take a look now at somebody who gets, uh, they go to court, let's say they beat up one of our daughters or our, our wives or even us, mm -hmm. and they get sentenced to a year in county jail, they're doing about 10 days. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that in of itself, people out there, and, and I, I know you know this, and I know the public knows this, because if you have somebody on your block that is the common guy that goes to jail or the guy down the block that sells the drugs, mm -hmm. you know they know the system. I mean, when I was working gang enforcement and I was out there and we would stop people, you know, we'd say, hey, you know, we're going to be back in half an hour to, uh, to check this out. And then they would look at us and go, no, you won't. You get off at 11. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I go, oh, my God, they know our shift. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they, they know. These yeah. criminals know. So when, when they have been trained now and they know that they can do whatever they want and they're only going to do 10 days or just do a turnaround, get one meal in jail and leave, then it's okay to commit the crime and they don't care anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's one reason crime is going up. You know, even here in Santa Clarita, I mean, these are the most – this is – this area right here is one of the most – pro-law enforcement Absolutely. areas, I will say, in the country. Mm. I would agree with you on that. Yeah. They, and, they, and, you know, up here, yeah. there is very little crime, but crime is up here. And the reason is, is not because the deputies aren't doing their job. The deputies want to do their job, but the deputies are less likely to do everything that they need to do in order to, to keep the crime down because of the fact they don't want to be accused of profiling. They don't want to be accused of, of force. They don't yeah. want to be accused of all sorts of different things. And you know what? I have told many people that if I actually became a deputy today, I don't know that I could function in this environment that mm -hmm. we have right now. It's difficult because you're asking these deputies to, to handcuff the criminals, but in a lot of cases it seems like we're handcuffing the deputies from, from doing their job Absolutely. to the fullest extent. Absolutely, 100%. Um, in regards to Santa Clarita specifically, I mean, what are some actions you would take to help lower that crime rate? Well, first of all, the morale in the department is extremely low. I mean, there, there was a survey done by the Professional Peace Officers Association. This was done a long time ago. Uh, this was done almost a year ago, and it's worse now, I guarantee you that. And uh, at the point in time when that, when that survey was done and morale was so low, that was shared with the sheriff, and the sheriff asked the union mm -hmm. to hold that survey. He would try and make things better. Things didn't get better. No. In fact, they got worse. And so ultimately what POPA did, uh, the association, they released that survey, and that survey came out. And I'll tell you, the one thing, if you want the crime rate and you want things addressed, deputies know how to do this. Yeah. They all you have to do is let them do their job. If you let a deputy do your, their job and politics stays out of it and all these ridiculous policies are fixed, then you're going to see that crime rate go down because deputies absolutely, and I've been around lots of them, are professional, know how to do a, a vehicle stop, know who to pull over, know mm -hmm. when to pull over. And I'll tell you what, they know how to coordinate a call like you would not believe. Yeah. The other thing is response times would get better. When you talk about response times, I mean, right now the department has so many vacancies on the department from a failure to actually hire for the last three years at the wow. rates that they need to hire. 
So you got deputies all over the place that are actually working or being forced to work two to three times a week, maybe, uh, of overtime shifts. Now, I'm not the kind of guy that would like to get pulled over by a guy who's being forced to work. I mean, that's, yeah. that's not right. me. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of things that need to be done, but I think a lot of it comes back to the hiring. A lot of it comes back to the policy. A lot of it comes back to the support that they need from management and the executives. Okay. Uh, Good. Um, I, I understand that. I mean, I think the vast, obviously there are, are bad cops. There, there's bad people at every single job, but the vast majority of sheriffs are there because not because of the pay, not because of the benefits, because they want to do the job. They want to help their community. Uh, and I, I get that, that trying to hinder them from doing their job, it kind of gets to a point where they're like, well, why even bother? Uh, you know, when their morale is so low, uh, when you're trying to help people and people are constantly attacking you for your, doing your job, that's got to be difficult. I, I couldn't imagine what that's like. Yeah, you know what? Deputies aren't afraid of complaints. Yeah. They, they aren't afraid of complaints because they have dealt with complaints all the time, and complainers, by the way. Yes. <laughs> but, but the bottom line is with, with deputy sheriffs, they want to know that when a false complaint comes in, when, when somebody complains about them that's not true, that they're going to have the support of the sheriff and the executives to have them figure that out rather than being accused on a he said, she said, and then getting disciplined for something that's, that's honestly yeah. – not factual. And so that's where they are right now. And what they want is they want a fair shot. That's all they want. Deputies don't, they're not asking for something special. Yeah. They're just asking for a fair assessment. Okay. Um, I'm just going to ask you a quick question that was just uh, sent to me by another deputy. Um, they would like to know, so when it's very, it's very difficult for, uh, for deputies to perform if they have, if they have some sort of disability, correct? Yes. Uh, to be out in the field. Um, apparently, um, so this is a question from a deputy who was asking, uh, why was a man with a permanent colostomy bag hired who is now in the academy? Why would so, is, is that something that could be, uh, that could be, detri that could be, uh, that affect him in the field? That could make it, is that something that, that that's a problem? Um, this is, like I said, this is coming from a, ask, asked by another, by somebody, by a deputy, and they're just curious on your, your take on why somebody with a, with a disability, we, we shouldn't discriminate against people with disabilities, but right. also if you're not able to perform the job uh, at, at, at the highest level, uh, why would somebody like that be accepted into the academy? Well, you know what? I can't answer that question. I'm going to do the best I can, but mm -hmm. it's, only because, yeah. it's, it's yeah. only because I don't know what the impact is of a colostomy bag if it's ripped from your body. Right. Now, let's face it. That's going to happen. Because this person's going to get in fights, these things are going to happen. And where my concern would be is if I have a partner who has a colostomy bag and this thing gets ripped off, is my partner going to be able to perform and save my life, help me if we're in the middle of a fight? Mm -hmm. So, you know, disabilities, all of those things, many of them we can accommodate. But if this person's disability is such that they can't get out and do arduous work mm -hmm. or they're placing themselves in the position that if they get in a fight, they're going to be out of the fight immediately, then that wouldn't be appropriate. Yeah. It wouldn't be appropriate for that person to be hired. Now, I worked personnel. I was the director of personnel for five years. So we looked at all these disabilities and we did that. And this is the first time I will tell you in all of the time I've ever been there that anybody I know has ever been hired with a colostomy back. Okay. Okay. That's, uh, that's, that's interesting. So well, thank you very much for, uh, for answering that question for, sure. for one of our listeners. Um, and obviously we all know we recently had a very, uh, very tragic incident happen in Las Vegas. Um, how, if you were, if you were, when you, or if you do become uh, the sheriff, what, how are we going to handle situations like that if that happens here in LA County? What what are we going to do to make sure that people are safe while not infringing on Second Amendment rights? Yeah, look, that's a sad situation there, and I know you know just look, Blue Lives Matter. You got that on your shirt. Yes, I, I, I can't yeah, wait. I can't yeah. wait until you start selling those in the Russian hacking room right. yeah. <laughs> on your, You know, I'll be the first one on your website oh, to buy this yeah, stuff. Right. But, but I'm going to tell you that you know there. Guns don't kill people. People kill people. And in this situation, that's exactly what we had. Yeah. Now, how this guy got all that stuff up to that 23rd or 30, 20, 30 32nd floor, floor yeah. is, is unbelievable to me. You know, I, I think there's a lot more questions that need to be answered than have been answered. Mm -hmm. uh, but Las Vegas, I'm sure, is doing a wonderful job. They've got the FBI there. And whenever you have the FBI there, we all know that law enforcement takes a back seat yeah. when it comes to information that, that goes out. But here's the bottom line, and your question is, what would we do differently or better here? Um, 
we and you both know this that that I'm a gun guy. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't you know I'm not the type of guy that's going to say well we got to get rid of guns or mm-hmm. we got to do something like that because that's not the answer. The answer is not to get rid of guns. The answer is I hope there's enough people there firing back at the person who's firing at them. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to this situation, you know, this bump stock and all the other stuff, the things that will make something fully automatic like that or at least seem fully automatic, we got to take a look at those types of things because those yeah. we do have to take a look at. Mm-hmm. Um, automatic weapons. Well, we don't, we don't need automatic no, weapons. Nobody needs no. an M60. We, we don't, we don't yeah. need that stuff. No. But, but here is the bottom line. We have to be looking at people. We, when we have a venue like that here in L.A. and we have high-rises around it, we're going to have to start taking a look at things like that. We're going to have to take a look at if we can put something up to at least shield uh, the spectators mm-hmm. in those sorts of situations from them having clear view. You know, this was one of those situations where everybody is taught to do certain things. If you're being fired at, we teach you, okay, drop down. You know, when you when you hear and there were deputies there. We know there was one one deputy that was was shot there. Yes. But we had I had a friend of mine, a sergeant who was there and right next to him, uh, his neighbor was with him and she got shot twice. And so, you know, I'm I'm frantically calling down to make sure the sergeant's okay and I'm not getting answers back because he's too busy trying to save this person. Right. Right next to them on the other side of his wife, the person got shot in the head and they did not make it. So, you know, these are things that, that they're seeing right there live in front of them. Now, the sergeant, he has seen things like this. He knows. But how about all the people, all the, all the, yeah. the community people who have never seen anything like this? The, the, the trauma that they're going to have after this incident is unbelievable. Help groups. So, and, and the reason I'm saying this is that we as a Los Angeles County Sheriff need to assist with, with groups, putting these people together. Uh, you know, I, I'm looking at a list that you have here of, mm-hmm. of, of trauma victims and people who are shot here. It's not just the victim, though. Mm-hmm. It's the families. It's the friends. It's yeah. everybody else associated with this that may need to get together in groups. So the sheriff's department can certainly put those groups together. When it comes to these venues, we need to take a, a good hard look at it. I mean, there's a lots of sports venues now where you know uh, uh, police departments are now taking charge of security. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this is a brand new area that we got to take a look at. You know, I don't I don't think that we need another. Th- this is 9/11 took flight out of it. I mean, I went, I flew from Denver from the last Dodger game the other day. And I, I was one of those guys, you know, I, when I get in line, I take my wallet out, I take my keys out, I triple check myself. Mm-hmm. I don't want a, this thing to buzz on me. Right, right. And I get there and all of a sudden it buzzes on me. I'm going, what the heck? I, I don't have anything. And they go, oh, no, you're random. Go over there and you're going to have to put your hands up and you're going to have to. <laughs> I'm sitting there going, oh, my God. And then yeah. when this happens, now you're now I'm wondering, every time I enter a casino, Am I going to have to be strip searched because I'm going into a casino? So we as Americans have to decide what it is that we're going to do, what we're going to put up with, and how far we're going to go to, and I'm not going to, the word isn't a press because I don't think that, but, but to, to keep our rights mm-hmm, mm-hmm. of entry, keep our ability to live in a land that we love and that we came here for because of the freedoms we have. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, that's a great answer. I, I, I like that. I think that uh, it's something that we can all agree on. Um, yeah, and Dave and I are definitely going to be uh, jumping into that segment. Jumping into the, yeah, but the topic on the next segment. We, right? want, we have a couple more questions that I that I just want to that I think are, are important. Um, well, another another viewer here who's watching right now um, asks about body cameras um, on on deputies. Uh, where where are we at with how many how many deputies wear cameras now, and is that something that sh- that that you would like to see ramped up? They like to see more so that to, for the protection of themselves uh, against uh, false accusations, which I think that's I, for me. I think that's that's kind of one of the biggest things. Um, but I've also heard that some people may believe that it might hinder them being able to to do their jobs. So, what's your stance on on body cameras and and getting them on on all active sheriffs? Well, I'll tell you. Here's my position on body cameras, and I can't give you the exact numbers because I won't be the sheriff until June, right, <laughs> or November, right, depending. <laughs> but uh, here, here here's my position. My position is that body cameras are good. Deputies, I believe, most deputies would love to wear them, but I do have an issue. And here's the issue. Every time there's a malfunction, every time something goes wrong with a camera, Mm -hmm. you know who's going to be accused? The officer. The deputy sheriff. The deputy deputy sheriff's going to be accused of having rigged that camera, of having done something, of having hid something. We've got cases going on right now where where there's 
a deputy's being accused of doing something to a camera that was in a building. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's ridiculous, but, but that's my fear. My fear isn't the body camera. Deputies will wear body cameras all the time. When I was in patrol, it was back in the days when we had to stop in phone booths. We didn't have cell phones, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, for a large portion of that time. But what we carried were tape recorders. We taped almost everything we did because we needed proof when somebody lied against us that we're telling the truth yeah. mm -hmm. and the other person is. So I'm for body cameras, but I think there's got to be a lot of work done on how things are going to happen with malfunctions and things like that so that deputies aren't accused mm -hmm. wrongfully of having done it, like in a foot pursuit, and the camera, something happens to yeah. it, and then all of a sudden, at the end of that pursuit, somebody says, well, you just turned your camera off because you knew what you were going to do at the end uh, of it. Yeah. You know, and, and those are the things we got to be careful of. Okay. Right. Well, great. Well, um, I we lo love everything you had to say. I hope uh, everyone that's listening understands and, and gets the idea that you really want what's best for the deputies and for the public. Um, not for the criminals, but for the, the yeah, deputies yeah. and the public. Absolutely. Law-abiding citizens. Yeah. Yes. So um, so thank you very much for coming on the show. I appreciate you coming on. Uh, the vote is on June 5th of 2018, so we're about eight months out, uh, so, so seven months out. Um, so we'll hopefully be able to catch up with you again uh, before the election and see how things are going, and uh, and hopefully we can we can get things going where the, the officers can feel confident and do their jobs uh, in a way that protects the citizens and and make sure that, that we're safe out there. So thank you very much, Bob. David, thank you, Bob. Thank you Sean. Thank you Absolutely, very much. Absolutely, Bob. All right. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about a little bit more about Vegas and the locals that, um, that, that unfortunately were injured and one that was killed. Uh, so we'll return here shortly. Thank you. Looking for the best return on your investment? Do you want your hard-earned dollars stretched to do the most good for your community? That means that out of every dollar donated, a full 99 cents goes directly to the need being addressed. Help the Children is in Santa Clarita, helping Santa Clarita families and other Santa Clarita charities. When compared to more than 1.2 million charities in America, Help the Children is rated the seventh most efficient charity in the nation. Operating on a 1% overhead, and we receive no government funding for our operations in the community. If you are looking to donate to the good of the Santa Clarita community, please consider partnering with Help the Children. What is donated specifically for Santa Clarita is kept in Santa Clarita and will help over 5,000 families and over 10 other agencies. Please visit our website and or call our office to make a difference in our awesome town community. 702-8852-helpthechildren.org. Healthcare can be difficult if you're underinsured or have Medi-Cal. Samuel Dixon Family Health Center can help. Services are available on a sliding fee schedule. The mission of the Samuel Dixon Family Health Center is to give the Santa Clarita Valley access to affordable, quality primary care. There are three locations to serve you, Canyon Country, Newhall, and Valverde. Go to sdfhc.org for more information and to find the location most convenient for you. Everybody wants cheap airfare, but where do you find it? You call low-cost airlines. Their prices are direct from the airlines, and they're so low you can't find these fares published anywhere. They specialize in cheap flights, discount hotel rooms, cheap car rental rates, and great package deals anywhere around the world. Wherever you want to go, they can help you get there cheaply and with the best price guarantee. If you want the lowest prices on your airline tickets or other travel services, call now. That's right, call. That's the only way to get these rates. Experts are standing by 24-7 to get you the cheapest air fare and hotel rates available so don't wait call right now for the lowest travel prices anywhere and for great last minute travel deals too call right now operators are standing by 1-800-452-1075 800-452-1075 800-452-1075 that's 1-800-452-1075 hometown station Right, welcome back to Connecting Right Radio. Mm -hmm. um, we are. We just had Bob Lindsay on, great uh, candidate for for sheriff. Yeah. I think uh, he's going to do. I hope he does really well. At least um, I know we're trying to get uh, the sheriffs behind him, but 
uh, we'll see what happens. Anyways, uh, we're going to move on to the very, very sad situation that happened hours after we ended our show last week. So uh, it's taken a week for us to be able to talk about it since we're only on once a week. <laughs> yeah, and I, I also think it, it's taken us probably a week or so to really process this, like most people. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, you had a, a evil, despicable, and hateful individual spend 10 minutes – uh, targeting and slaughtering our, our friends, neighbors, and loved ones. Yes. Uh, that's, that's horrible. <sighs> um, it, it's really difficult to put into words exactly what happened. And, and the one thing I've taken from that is, is despite this individual who rained down evil upon these 22,000 people, mm -hmm. you had everyone, no matter what their religion, race, sexual orientation, uh, political identity, no matter what – it was you had them band together yes. as Americans. Yep. Um, and out of the 489 individuals that were taken to the hospital, not a single one of them died. Right. And that's testament to the fact that everybody there got together to shield each other, to help each other, to carry everyone off. Right. Um, and really come together and seek safety and protection for these people that were hurt. Right. And um, fortunately, um, we did have some. Uh, a couple, I think we had a couple casualties. We know that um, that some of the people that we get our information from are are still doing updates, but we know that we unfortunately did lose uh, John Fippen, who was yeah. a um, who was a business owner out here. Uh, his son Travis was with him. Uh, Travis actually has a pretty amazing story. He was hit. Uh, he just said, bandage me up as quick as you can. And he's a, he's a medic. So he ran right back out there and he helped, uh, he helped 14 people who were shot also. So while he was injured, he went out and still, I mean, it gives me goosebumps just to yeah, think it's about a, it's amazing. That somebody it's a that somebody has the courage to go out and, and do all that. Uh, I wish that everyone would have the courage to be able to do that, but, it, but you know, you know, with fight or flight, some people fight, some people, some people run and, and for the most part, people are just trying to get away and trying to get to safety and it's Travis what, threw himself right back into it. It's one of those things that, you know, I, I've never been in that situation i couldn't even honestly tell you how i would react to it mm -hmm. um it, it makes me happy to see that nobody was pushing each other over uh you know jumping in front of or behind other people to shield themselves it was for the most part everybody was really looking out for one another which is yeah. honestly a beautiful thing yeah um i'm going to name off some other people but that are from santa clarita that were uh that were injured uh i apologize if i skewer and destroy some names that i can't uh that i that yeah. i don't may not be able to say correctly but uh caesar uh Renuccio, uh the owner of body shop 661 was injured uh he's doing he's doing much better now um dominica ziola she's a real estate agent from santa clarita uh, Susie Laporte, another SCV resident, uh, Bruce Budd, Wayne Horn, uh, owner of Horn's Backflow and Plumbing in Valencia was hit. Um, Kim Halden Peoples, she's an elementary school here at Meadows over on Lyons. Um, Jesse Preston is a loan officer at Santa Clarita Valley Skyline Home Loans. Uh, Stacy Brown uh, Fusano is a single mother of two from Saugus. And then also um, Officer Andrew Daring was hit of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Um, and he was also a uh, Santa Clarita uh, resident. I know that there that we may have missed some names that there's others um, but these are the ones that we were that we have confirmation on at this point uh, there's still some that are that are even a week later that are still coming out so yeah um, it's just uh, it's a very tragic situation and it's um, you know it's it's great to see everybody come together um, but it's it's disappointing that it takes a tragedy like this to bring people together we should be able to come together without the loss of life yeah i i think that's kind of just goes to who we are as americans that we're, we're very stubborn in our political beliefs um and argumentative towards each other that don't you know towards people that don't have that same political belief but when there's a tragedy at the end of the day we're americans yeah uh, we get together there there is no evil on this planet that can divide us mm -hmm. And, um, and, and it's, we, we're, me and you, we do have, we have friends that are liberals and, um, you know, some people still think that it's difficult for liberals and conservatives to get along unless something like this happens. But, uh, regardless of this, of, of this event, uh, we do have, we, we have, we're in talks with, uh, feed SCV, mm -hmm. uh, run by Scott Irvin and, uh, Todd Wilson, uh, who are on the other side of the spectrum from us and we are throwing all political affiliation out. We're just going to work together. We're going to see uh, within the next couple of weeks, if we can put together a fundraiser uh, to, to where 
people can donate to, to feed SCV. And these are going to be donations that are going to be going and helping uh, the local victims here. Um, I know that there's a lot of money that's been put in to go help out pe um, people from all the, all the injuries and all the families that are dealing with the grief of loss. Um, but we are going to we're going to focus on on our community here and 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 making sure that the people here are um, are definitely taken care of yeah so uh we'll we'll have more on that hopefully uh, next week maybe we can even uh see if we can get mr Irvin to to come on the show and uh and fingers talk, crossed talk with us i don't know um but like like every type of, of situation that involves a gun as soon as it happens uh gun control is immediately brought is immediately brought up um and it's, I don't, I, yeah, you, get some I, time to grieve. I, I saw, you know, Hillary Clinton the next morning tweeted that uh, this was blaming the NRA, that we needed gun control. And it's like, it, it's been eight hours. Right. Give it some time. I, you know what? And, and I'll admit, you know, us on the right have the same issue when it, when it comes to somebody who's uh, a Muslim or somebody who's not American shooting. Mm -hmm. uh, we immediately jump on that bag and wagon. I, I, I think... We should. We all need to agree that anytime there's a tragedy, give it 24 hours. Yeah. Just don't bring politics into it. Just let people grieve. Mm -hmm. uh, give it 24 hours, and then at that point, you can bring up whatever discussions need to be brought up. Yeah. And let the let the families have their time to grieve. I mean, they're going to take a lot more than 24 hours. But before you start politicizing it, you yeah. know, I mean, because we uh, there's Facebook posts that went up right away. That's like, if, oh, if we have more gun control, this and that, this would never happen, and stuff like that. And it's like. And yeah, uh, just it's uh, and it, it all it always uh, he reheats the, the the gun control debate. The gun control debate is always really heated, um, yeah. but it just it it fires it fuels the fire of it. And um, and you know, I, I, like Hillary Clinton said, if, if he was using a silencer, people wouldn't have heard the heard the the bullets or wouldn't have heard the shots, and they wouldn't have gotten down, and more people that, could have gotten hurt. That's or not killed. How, first off, it's not a silencer, and secondly, that's not how a suppressor works. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um. It's just idiotic, and the, the the problem I have with the gun control debate is the same points keep getting brought up over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. No matter what side of the issue you are on, Google District of Columbia versus Heller. Mm -hmm. It is the a Supreme Court case when District of Columbia in two thousand eight banned handguns. Yeah. Uh, Supreme Court said that is a violation of your Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. They also made it clear that the militia part of the second amendment it, that guns don't apply to just to a militia it applies to all citizens equally right um it, in there though i mean they they also made it clear that there's there's common use for guns that that handguns are common use commonly used to, for home protection right that you, you can't outright ban them right um it does give some leeway for what states can and can't do um you know getting into the argument that we just need to ban all guns that's never going to happen Okay. Um, you know, a lot of people say, well, the, our forefathers never uh, thought of the modern firearms today. And the, Google that court case. The Supreme Court made it clear. The Second Amendment applies to modern weapons just like the First Amendment applies to modern forms of communication. Yeah. Uh, so get rid of those arguments. Because when you have somebody on the left bringing up that as their argument or their talking point, mm -hmm. it, it immediately shuts down any constructive form of debate you can actually have on the issue. Right. And it's uh and it it just makes it more difficult and and, and it becomes unproductive. Yeah. Um. And it, we we talk about that a lot about about when when we're dealing with these type of issues, we need to do something that's productive and moving forward, and, and it gets somewhere where where it where it takes effect and helps out the people. Yeah. Um. Whether it's whether it's one way or the other, but it needs to do it needs to do something. Um. And right now the the bump stock is uh is a thing where, um you know the uh, Feinstein for California is is putting uh is is putting out legislation to have that um, banned here in California, mm -hmm. and even the GOP is uh, putting out. Paul Ryan's pushing it to yeah, the House. Paul, yeah. Uh, NRA is saying that they, it bump stops need to be it needs to be looked at if mm -hmm. they're within regulation or not. Yeah. Um, I, I think you're, this is going to be a weird case where the NRA doesn't try and stop any legislation that goes through to ban bump stops, yeah. which needs to happen. Yeah. I don't, I don't see a, there, I don't see a reason for owning a bump stock. No, I mean, there, there's no reason for anybody to have a fully automatic assault rifle. No. Or a device that would make it act as such. Exactly. So, I mean, I don't, I know I don't need one, um, for, for my rifle. So I don't see the need for the, anybody to really need one. I mean, it's maybe it's fun to go out in the field and, and, or we got a shooting range to be able to do that, but it's, it just seems, it seems a little too, too much for me. Like, yeah. It's excessive. Yeah. Um, there, there's no reason for that. Yeah. So, um, 
So, yeah, so we are going to take um, another quick break here. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be back in a little bit. We have uh, we, we've talked about some – we had Bob on, which is great, and then we talked about uh, some sad news. We also have some other sad news that we are going to be discussing. But in between, we actually have some uh, – we, ha we have some winners come back from uh, – the Santa Clarita residents come back as winners from Laughlin from a dart tournament. So mm. we're going to – we're just going to touch on that to mm. have a little Darts. bit of a – Yeah. Mm. Uh, we, we threw tiny spears at, at, yeah. uh, at, 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 at targets. Um, wow, amazing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> with accuracy. Yeah, so, physics is great. Right? Anyways, uh, we'll be back shortly. Drug and alcohol use can lead to troubles at school or work, relationship problems, financial or legal difficulties, medical and psychiatric issues. I'm Bob Sheritz, the host of The Way Out Recovery Hour, airing every Monday at noon. The Way Out Recovery Hour features prominent guests and organizations discussing the epidemic of drugs and alcohol in our valley. Don't miss The Way Out Recovery Hour every Monday at noon. Asking for help is the first step. There is the way out. Healthcare can be difficult if you're underinsured or have Medi-Cal. Samuel Dixon Family Health Center can help. Services are available on a sliding fee schedule. The mission of the Samuel Dixon Family Health Center is to give the Santa Clarita Valley access to affordable, quality primary care. There are three locations to serve you, Canyon Country, Newhall, and Valverde. Go to sdfhc.org for more information and to find the location most convenient for you. There's only one Santa Clarita plastic surgeon who is Yale trained and board certified, Dr. Justin Heller. To be a board certified plastic surgeon like myself, what that truly entails is about five to seven years of honed surgical training in reconstructive, all areas, as well as aesthetics, which means your facelifts, your breast augmentation, your body contouring, true training and board certification. In fact, that's the only board certified area that can be achieved in this realm. Dr. Justin Heller, warm, understanding, always available for guidance because he's local. Heller Plastic Surgery. Healthcare can be difficult if you're underinsured or have Medi-Cal. Samuel Dixon Family Health Center can help. Services are available on a sliding fee schedule. The mission of the Samuel Dixon Family Health Center is to give the Santa Clarita Valley access to affordable, quality primary care. There are three locations to serve you, Canyon Country, Newhall, and Valverde. Go to sdfhc.org for more information and to find the location most convenient for you. Your, your hometown station. All right, welcome back to Connecting Right. Yeah. Episode three. Uh, episode three. three. Yeah, we yeah we didn't we didn't number this one yet. That's so. right. Three three. That's where we're on. Three point three. Three point. Yeah. Is that the segment we're on. <laughs> yes, we're okay. on segment three. Um, so we have, we have some some fun fluffy news. Uh, yeah. So uh, I just got back today from Laughlin. Mm -hmm. um, I went out there for a dart tournament. Uh, I left those Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And um, there was quite a few of us that went out from Santa Clarita, but it was a tournament that attracted people from all of all over Southern California and Arizona. So there was there was quite a few people there, and we have some pretty good dart players out here. There was um, there's eight divisions, and within those divisions, we had uh, uh, there's four uh, places or people that play. So you get first, second, third, and fourth. Um, uh, there's people that hit about six of those of those spots from Santa Clarita. So being from all over Southern California and from Arizona, that's a pretty big deal. Um, in one division, we had a a guy named Daniel Reyes. He came in first place, um, and then we're uh, division a little bit lower was uh the division that i was in and we had uh robin uh, excuse me robin west come in and she got uh fourth place in our decision in our division and then stephanie cook also from santa clarita took third place uh chalau um oh, i can't forget his i forget his last name it's uh I can't. I'm not going to try to guess it and be awfully Smith. horrible. No, you call him Smith. No. Right now. <laughs> John Doe. But, uh, but no, his name's Chalau. Uh, I didn't even know he was from Santa Clarita until I was playing him in the in the finals. And, yeah. And um, and he came in second, and and I took home first in that one. So uh, so it was pretty cool to see so many Santa Clarita residents there, and just the camaraderie that's there. Because uh, you know there were some people they got called up, and you'd have like two or three because they do a banquet at the end. And then so like someone gets called up, you have like two or three people. Like I tried, I tried to clap for everybody just because you know it kind of sucks to to like do well in something and have no one 
no appreciate it. But then, it, yeah. but then there, there's certain people that get up and have like half the room clapping for them, which was uh, the situation that we had. So, um, but it was, it was pretty cool to be able to have all these people come back with, um, with, with trophies and, and money and representing uh, Santa Clarita out there. And, and these, uh, you know, we, we do tournaments uh, like every Saturday at 3 p.m. at Schoonerville. Uh, we do a tournament there, which is always, it's always a good time. Um, there's, uh, leagues that are set up out here and that's, and that's how you qualify for your different divisions for these tournaments. Uh, they do one in, in Vegas, Reno, they're going to be doing another one out in Laughlin. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really fun to go out. You meet a lot of cool people and, um, and we, you know, we just get to go out there and we get to represent Santa Clarita and, yeah. and come back and I'm curious, what is a division in darts like is that like is it based on your height because i imagine that there's are you <laughs> no, in the praying mantis all. division right. of darts <laughs> well that's one thing everyone says they're like like can you just reach over and yeah, put, you your, just... put your put <laughs> your <laughs> I'm, I'm six foot three and i have long arms um no it's just it's just how you throw i'm not uh i'm not the strongest thrower i'm not the weakest thrower but i'm not the the strongest thrower there's guys that are called masters division and those are the guys that um you know they're, they're going to take out a uh, there's a game called 501 and 301 and it's to get the point is to get the all the way down to get 501 points exactly or 301 points exactly mm -hmm. and they do it's called uh, masters out which you have to hit a, a double or a triple um so you have to like a double 20 if you have a if you have a 40 you need to hit a double 20 and anyways uh so those guys they, they just knock it out in like like two or three rounds like okay. or three or four rounds and us we take we take a little bit longer but um the disparage between the, or the difference between each division really isn't that much uh, so I'll probably step up a division next year since I won this one and I probably should do pretty well, but, um, but anyway, so yeah, so with just a little bit awesome. of bright news that Santa Clarita did something great, uh, and Santa, Santa Clarita, Clarita did something are, great, so. uh, apparently we're amazing at darts. Yes. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's some, it's something that people really that d don't yeah. know about, you know, and there's people that when, when they see me out playing darts and they're like, you're really good. Like, dude, like, would like, it be well, a stretch for me to say that Santa Clarita is the, uh, alleged dart capital of the world? No, uh, the Valley, the Valley kicks our butt. Oh, darn. Unfortunately. Well, maybe next year, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> but um, anyway, so now now that we had happy time, now we're going to go back to sad time, unfortunately. Um, Friday night, there was a woman who she had uh, just given birth to twins. Uh, it was her fifth and sixth uh, child. Uh, most when, when a lot of twins are born, they're, they're born premature, premature. and they're, they're in the hospital. So she went to go visit them and on her way home from visiting them, she was str uh, struck by a suspected drunk driver and killed. Um, I mean, it's just it's horrible. Yeah. I can't even, I can't even believe, I can't even imagine what, uh, what her husband is going through no. at this time. Uh, the, the other four kids, I don't, I don't know the ages of the kids exactly. So I'm not sure if any of them are old enough to comprehend what's going on at this point or not. Um, but it's just, I just, I, I can't, I, I just like, I, I thought about it and I was like, what if, what if that happened to my wife? And I'm just like, I can't imagine, yeah. or if that happened to me, what my wife would be going through. And I just, I just, it breaks my heart. I, I just can't imagine. It, it really goes, I mean, it, it kind of ties back to, towards Vegas where these awful, it, it just seems like in the world today that the worst things happen to the best people. Mm -hmm. It's just horrible. I mean, th this woman is seeing her newborn premature twins mm -hmm. in the hospital leaving yeah. the hospital to go home to her family she and gets hit by an alleged drunk driver yeah. it's and just it, horrible and never makes it home um and they there is crowdfunding going out right now uh which is awesome because people there are awesome people out there who are trying to help out um there was like i said this happened friday night there was a uh you caring.com crowdfunding that was set up we'll give you the address here for that in a second but it was set up for a hundred thousand dollars and they're already at a hundred and three yeah thousand dollars so less than two days yeah so it's i mean and people have already so many people have given to, to vegas and now they're able to and now they're giving to this you know it just shows that the caring that we have here in our valley uh for for when when unfortunate things like this happen and and we do come together and try to make sure that that, um, that people are taken care of. Uh, you know, some, some people don't understand the, the community value. We, we are the third largest city in LA County and we still have that small town feel yeah. uh, where people want to come together and people still want to be able to help each other out. Um, anyways, the crowdfunding site is youcaring.com forward slash all one word, Jacob Evans hyphen nine, seven, three, four, nine, one. And I'm going to put that into the, um, the comments of the KHTS live feed right now. The show notes. Show notes. I think that's a technical term for it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll call it that. Yeah. Um, 
but I mean, we 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 try to avoid these situations yeah. as much as we can. We um, you know, the we we do the the Santa Clarita Sheriff's and the CHP both get funding for for DUI checkpoints. Um, and people get a little indifferent about those. Some people think that they just get that uh, they get in the way and they slow their, their they slow them down. And it's like just take ten minutes to make sure that that, that other people are safe. It's yeah. fine. Um, but we last one we had the checkpoint was on September fifteenth. It was conducted by the CHP over on uh, over in Stevenson Ranch. And some people say, well, well, if you if they're not arresting anybody, what's the point of doing it? Well, the, here's the statement from uh, from the CHP. It says the goal of the DUI checkpoint is to create awareness among the motoring public to deter people from driving under the influence and to keep the streets safe for all. Even though arrest totals do not rise dramatically, the psychological influence a checkpoint has on the motoring public is invaluable. I I would agree with that. I mean, I I would imagine if there was a checkpoint every Friday night, uh, you're going to have a lot less people deciding to go out and drink and drive. Uh, There's just that, that psychological fear of it. Um, and, And really anything we can do to prevent another tragedy like this i'm all for yeah and there's uh, you know there are ways of of avoiding these situations and i really it, it really kills me that we have so many options of ways that we that if you want to go out and you want to have a couple of drinks that you can get home safely the drivers on the streets can get can be safe because you're not out there uh, being a drunk driver um you know we, we have the obvious ones uber lyft uh local local taxis but we also have uh, a couple other services mm-hmm. out here in santa clarita which are really good we have the designated drivers of santa clarita where they will come uh you call them up as long as you're going anywhere in santa clarita you pay twenty dollars they come and and they'll, they'll pick you up in your car and drive you home yeah um there's a, a man and a woman that that run this and they have other drivers too and and what they'll do is, is so if you're a female then the female will get in your car with you if you're a male the male will get in your car with you and they'll drive your car home and for 20 bucks and 20 dollars is way less than a dui it's far less i mean it's it's, it's, it's 20 to, bucks to is life, probably cheaper than an life, uber so. from yeah. across town uh, in, in some cases it could I mean, be yeah uh and again the phone number is 661-313-8336 mm-hmm. and we'll also be putting these in the comments also um, and then for you little uh, rascally teens out there that are uh, going out and having your mom and dad are out of town, you're having a party and trying not to get the house destroyed and, um, and your friends are over so your friends can get home safe. There's also the SCV Safe Rides for Teens. Yeah. So uh, make sure you share this with uh, – I doubt we have a, a younger audience below like 20. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, at least you can share this with them, uh, SCV Safe Rides for Teens, and that's 661-259-6330. Also, you can find them online uh, as an adult. You can also uh, volunteer for uh, in certain areas with that to help out also. so Yeah, if you're going to be dumb enough to uh, drink underage, then, then don't make the situation worse and drive. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you get home safely. We don't want – we don't want – kids do not need to be losing mothers no. uh, to drunk drivers. And the fact that it is happening is, is just – it's ridiculous. Um, I mean, no, if, you have, if you have a AAA card – you know, you can just call them up, be like, my car's not starting. I need to get towed home. You know, like anything, anything that you can do to not, uh, to not drive drunk. I mean, yeah. I don't, it, whatever it takes. Cause when you go out there, uh, every, uh, every person who's driving with you, their life is at risk. And who are you to go out and take that authority to, to take other people's lives and put them in your hands? Um, we should all be working on this together. We should be, you know, if you're an alcoholic, you know, go get a, Go go get some help somewhere if you need to, and if you're in denial, at least take an Uber. You yeah. know, like I, 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 there's not much you can do. Uh, addiction is a very very rough situation, um, and also people that sometimes they deal with. Uh, I mean, I was I was an undiagnosed uh, uh, with with depression, and and I had I had some incidents with uh, with drinking uh, over a decade ago before I got help, and luckily nobody got got hurt or injured at those times. So um, I had two incidents and. And, and I got the help and, and, and I realized what the issue was and why I was drinking so much, cut down on my drinking a whole lot. And, you know, and I keep my, my depression in check now. And, uh, it was years that I had been doing, I'd been doing well. And then my mom passed away and I made sure to go back to therapy, you know? So there's things that need to be done. There's, there's a lot of factors that contribute to yeah. drinking besides just going out and having a good time. And we need to make sure that we're, that we're taking care of all these and that, um, and that for your own, for your own sane health also. So, um, yeah, and again, I mean, that's just a horrible incident. If you want to donate, again, it's you caring, 
uh, dot com forward slash Jacob Evans dash nine seven three four nine one. Yes, and I also put that into the um, into the the comments or the, the show notes. Show notes, and we'll also be putting uh, designated drivers of Santa Clarita in the show notes and SCV safe rides for teens. So um, we got a couple minutes left. We're going to talk. Uh, recently, we talked about uh, Vincenzo's. Yes, uh, cut off the NFL. Vincenzo's and Sagas, mm-hmm. and they did something this week, or people did something to support them this yeah, week. And uh, what happened? A Large group of combat vets from all over Southern California decided to ride their motorcycles to Vincenzo Sagas in support of their decision to no longer play the NFL. Um, and I think the feelings the last week are kind of what people were wondering is if Vincenzo's was going to hurt financially from their decision to no longer show the NFL. And it's nice to see that that doesn't seem to be the case that there is a large group of people who are getting together to support them for that. Um, I mean, you, I wish I was there. I mean, it would have been a cool sight to see all of these combat vets on bikes there uh, having pizza and enjoying the atmosphere and having a good time. Yeah. And I've heard, you know, they've, uh, well, I went over uh, the, just before we talked about it, and, and I met with the the owner over there, and she said that they've had so much support. Uh, there was a pe- there was a few people that were against them cutting it off, and uh, they were saying, "Oh, this is going to hurt your business. This is going to hurt your business." They had well after the announcement, they had three of the best days ever. They've had two of the best Sundays now um, since since uh, she's taken over as owner. Um, you know, they're uh, right now. If you take your receipt from from Vincenzo's and you bring it over to our good friends over here at Commando Military Surplus, they're going to give you a discount on, on anything that you purchase hmm. uh so that's kind of cool they're nice. doing that yeah so uh you know there's a lot of there's a lot of support for what they're doing um you know it's some people are, are feel very strongly about it other people don't really care some people think that it's that that they shouldn't be that they shouldn't be dealing people think they should but you know um either way uh i think the game is is almost over at this point <laughs> that's going on right now so um but I think that may, hopefully we'll get some more viewers once football's over anyways, because I know there's still people watching. Yeah. Well, so. You know, everybody likes their football no matter what, really, right. when it comes down to it. I do. And uh, me being one of them. I know Cody does, too. Well, thank you guys <laughs> for tuning in. Uh, be sure to download the free KHTS app on your iPhones and Android devices. Mm-hmm. Now you can listen to KHTS wherever you are. You can also access KHTS news, social media, and more. The easiest way to get the app is by going to your Google Play or App Store and search KHTS. All right. I got that that time. You did. Yeah, you did it without, without any glitches. I about that. Yeah. And as always, Cody Como, thank you very much for being our board up and uh, making sure that we stay in line. Yeah. And uh, advice for the week, guys. Love one another. Just be kind. Yeah. And don't be Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> yes, please don't. <laughs> Good night.